Warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday evening, the 26th of March. Now, today we're going to do something a bit different because I've been reading this article for quite a bit of the time today, actually, um, from the British Medical Journal, uh, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. So pretty hard hitting article, really, indicating that evidence based medicine is a bit of an illusion. It's no longer real. It's uh, us perceiving something that's not there. Now, evidence based medicine, of course, is completely crucial because without evidence based medicine, before we had evidence based medicine, we were putting tannin on burns. We were giving arsenic to treat simple diseases. We were bleeding people to rebalance their humours. We were doing all sorts of things that probably did, and in fact, nearly always did uh, more harm than good. So we need to have evidence-based medicine. And this is what David Sackett pioneered in, in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So for evidence-based medicine, we should ideally have a, a, a good physiological underpinning. But the main things that David Sackett advocated were that there should be research-based evidence, clinical trial-based evidence where possible, that we should base our practice on uh, the consensus of expert opinion in the context of what is acceptable and uh, the patients are prepared to, to tolerate and to go along with and to cooperate with. So we have good patient uh, concordance. Without that, we're really back in, in the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. So this is from British Medical Journal. Now, British Medical Journal has been going for 180 years and the, re the part of the reason this paper is so impactful is it is in the British Medical Journal. The first journal to <laughs> the 1840s when the penny black stamps was first came out is as old as it's as old as postage. It was the first journal to publish the importance of asepsis during surgery. The first clinical trial was published in the British Medical Journal for the uh, streptomycin to treat tuberculosis. They were the first to identify that smoking caused lung cancer. I mean, just think about that. Before that, we didn't know that smoking caused lung cancer. It was the first to identify that smoking caused heart disease. And of course, we, we could go on. So it's a journal of a very, very powerful prominence. And uh, if you've got time, there's some interesting articles to look at there for background on that. Um, so evidence-based medicine has been corrupted, according to this article, by corporate interests, the interests of companies and profits. Failed regulation. Our regulatory authorities, according to this paper, are failing us. Now, we're not talking about anything particular. This is just a general comment on the way things are at the moment and the, the quite frankly appalling lack of trust that we have. Um, in, all sorts, in all sorts of things, we have lack of trust at the moment. Commercialization of academia. Academia needs to be the pure pursuit of truth. That's what it's about. And, and if that's been commercialised and there's financial interest in academia, that is not good. Not good at all. So these authors argue. So who are these authors? Well, there's um, John Durundi, research leader, uh, is in Adelaide, is also a child a psychiatrist as well as a researcher. And I'll put the links there if you'd like to know more about these people. They'll be in the description. And Lennig McHenry is an emeritus professor, California State University. And this paper was not commissioned. Uh, it has been open to external peer review. Um, so there you go. It's been, it's been peer reviewed. So this actually is, is a peer, peer reviewed opinion piece in the British Medical Journal. And it is... 100% completely readable. Um, you can read it in about, well, you, you can read it in about 10 minutes, to, but it takes about half an hour to go through it, 20 minutes to go through it in any detail, which I would recommend well worth it. Don't, don't take my word for things. The whole point about this channel is I'm pointing you to the evidence and just trying to explain it. Um, now, solid scientific foundation for practice. This is what evidence-based medicine is. It's a solid scientific foundation for medicine. It's not based on opinion. And even, even during uh, my, my, my career, I've, see, I've seen the differences in this. Things used to be done very much because the uh, consultant said so. It was based largely on uh, individual opinion 
for, for, albeit from senior experienced doctors. Whereas now things are very much more protocol driven. So, so, so recently work, or work have said, well, if, if so-and-so wants to do that, tell him to find me a protocol. <laughs> and you actually look up a protocol that tells you what to do with this rather than sit down and work it out. And these protocols need to be based on solid evidence. Now, th this, this, this talk and this article is no way impugning the individual clinician. Not at all at all. That they can only do what they are uh, permitted to do. So this is not about in in the integrity of individuals. This is about the integrity of some individuals, but it's about the integrity of the whole sort of medical paradigm altogether, really. Uh, now, validity of this new paradigm, that's the evidence-based medicine paradigm, depends on reliable data from clinical trials. This is what we need. But clinical trials are mostly conducted by the pharmaceutical industry who stand to make money. So we, we talked about this with our talk with uh, Dr. Eccles recently. How, how have we moved too far into this idea of a pill for every ill when there's so many things we know can prevent disease? Again, Tim Spector's working on this. The microbiome, the diet, the exercise the vitamin D deficiency that, that a lot of us are short of, the magnesium deficiency that can be a common problem, um, iron deficiency affecting huge percentages of the world's population leading to anemia, uh, iodine deficiency, all these things can be corrected to optimise health, preventing illness rather than waiting for illness to occur and then take a pill for every ill. But there's no money in that. The, the, the money is in a pill for every ill. Oh, and by the way, keep taking one a day for the rest of your life. Very often, unfortunately, is, is the situation we are in. So let me just give an example. So clinical trial data, um, largely conducted by the pharmaceutical industry. Now, to conduct a clinical trial, you're probably looking at around about $10 million to do a proper clinical trial. These are not cheap. So understandably, I suppose you could say that the pharmaceutical industry will only want to do them if it's going to get a return on its uh, investment. Why, why do research into vitamin D when you can't sell it for more than a pound or two for uh, 100 tablets in, in a supermarket when you can't license it, when it's out of patent? So, for example, uh, th this is from uh, this article here. And again... No, this is not me talking out loud. This is this is where the evidence is. So you get quite a few people like to uh, criticise me, which is absolutely fine. Always open to that. But uh, before you listen to criticism, say, well, where, where is the evidence for that? Unless they're giving the evidence sources. I'm not interested in other people's opinions. I'm not interested in my opinions. <laughs> we're only interested in what the evidence is is, is saying. If we're not evidence-based for nothing, that's the whole premise of evidence-based medicine. We need to be evidence-based. Otherwise, we're back in the dark ages. Anyway, this, this example here, um, as we say, it's from, from, this, from this journal. And um, J Japanese Journal of... Um, uh, J J Japanese Journal of uh, Antibiotics. Now, this article is, is written uh, certainly under the influence of, and one of the co-authors is this gentleman here, a Professor Santoshi Amura, who with William Campbell won the Nobel Prize in 2015 for their discovery of ivermectin. What Santoshi Amura does is he looks at different bacteria and works out what, what, uh, what, what chemicals they're producing and, and, and works out ways to duplicate these. It's very clever. Um, le le learning from nature and William Campbell was the chemist who uh, developed that so um, global trials in the clinical study of ivermectin and COVID-19 is the title of the article and as we say Santoshi Amora is one of the joint articles and in Japan actually they put the most important person last it's kind of the opposite to the way we do it so uh, Nobel Prize winner and, and this is uh, Katatsu University now, Katatsu University, Santoshi Amora has worked there since, oh, I think I think it's about 1965 or something. He's basically been there for, for all, all, all of his long and highly distinguished career. Uh, a university very experienced in doing, uh, organising clinical trials. So, uh, Santoshi Amora's university, Katatsu University, asked Merck and Co. Uh, to conduct clinical trials of ivermectin for COVID-19 in Japan. 
So this is, uh, these are direct quotes from this article here. It's actually on page 60 to 61, I think, of that article, but it's a direct, direct quote. So pandemic came along, university said, well, hey, let's look at repurposed drugs. Let's look at ivermectin. There's some ideas that um, it's antiviral. Let's check that out. Let's do a clinical trial on that. Now, this is not saying anything about ivermectin. It's just talking about what happened in this particular situation. So they um, offered the good, aus or the good sort of um, auspices of the university to, to conduct this clinical trial uh, in Japan. Um, the, the, now, the company, Mer Merck has got... Uh, um, the company had priority to submit the application because th they were already manufacturing it. So it was very polite what they did to do this. Uh, direct quote from the article however the company said it had no intention of conducting clinical trials no intention no intention of conducting clinical trials because the drug was out of patent you can't make money out of a drug that's out of patent that's not saying that's why they did that but it is true that you can't make any significant money out of a drug that's out of patent because anyone can manufacture it and of course it's manufactured generically uh, literally by the ton in india so here we have a classic example of it's the drug companies decided not to bother doing the clinical trial if they couldn't make any money. Of course, um, Merck went on to do clinical trials on Molnupiravir. Um, Pfizer went on to do extensive clinical trials on, on Paxlovid, the, the antivirals that are now uh, sometimes used. But um, they didn't want to do that one, even though the good facilities to do the clinical trial was there. Um, the release into the public domain of previously confidential pharmaceutical industry documents, which we've looked at recently, uh, gives valuable insight into the degree to which industry-sponsored clinical trials are misrepresented. Hmm. That's, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate that happens. Until this problem is corrected, evidence-based medicine will remain an illusion. It is not real. So we talk about evidence-based medicine, but that's no more than what we now call virtue signalling, what we used to call hypocrisy. And uh, of course, we know that documents have been released recently, which required a court order to release the documents. How appalling that a court must order the release of clinical information. Karl Popper, um, Working mostly in the 40s and 50s, um, Karl Popper, leading uh, philosopher, uh, put forward this idea of critical rationalism, advocated for the integrity of science and its role in an open democratic society. This data needs to be open. It should be open before court orders order its release. In my view, we shouldn't need court orders. Uh, a science of real integrity. In order to achieve this, practitioners need to be careful not to cling to cherished hypotheses. So we don't ride our own hobby horses. And we take seriously the outcome of the most stringent experiments. But of course, who decides whether the experiments are done? Unfortunately, that's often those that can make money out of it. Uh, the authors of this paper go on to say, this ideal, however, is threatened by corporations financial interests they believe trump the common good dear me medicine is largely dominated by a small number of very large pharmaceutical companies that do compete for market share but are effectively united in their effort to expand that market so the bigger the market is the more money they make so obviously it's good to have a pill for every ill because or an injection for every ill or an injection for every disease because then you're going to sell more of your product rather than things that promote and optimize health Th these companies can make more money by waiting for people to get sick it's um it's a complete reversal of the way we'd like it to be the cart is well and truly uh, before the horse scientific progress is thwarted by the ownership of data People that collect data keep it secret often and it's owned. And knowledge because industry suppresses negative trial results. 
So if you get a result that shows your drug is not working, well, we just probably might, might why, why bother publishing that? It won't look good. But when there's positive results, we can publish it. This is well known, of course. It's called publication bias. But this article is suggesting that, that people publish or keep stum, keep silent, um, depending on the commercial interest that's available from the release or the suppression of that particular piece of information. Uh, th if true, th this is, this is a, a massive, it's a massively bad thing. Uh, th they believe that often adverse events are not reported, unfortunately. Uh, and do not share raw data with the academic research community. Now, there's all sorts of people out there. You don't even have to be a, a clinical person. There's loads of people out there that are absolutely brilliant at statistics that can analyse data if the raw data is available. So why is the raw data not available so that objective evaluation can be made? And then the paper. Remember, we're talking about this paper here from the British Medical Journal. The paper goes on to say this. Patients die because of the adverse impact of commercial interests on the research agenda, universities and regulators. So the pharmaceutical companies you can kind of understand that they're making money out of it. But the uh, universities and the regulators, dear me. And of course, I'm sure you don't have to think too long. To think of some very prominent individuals who are now very senior in medicine or science and they've spent a few years in um, in a pharmaceutical company they've come out they've cashed a few million pounds worth of shares and gone back into senior positions um, i believe you call this the, the revolving door i'm sure you can think of people that are in that category so if someone's been in a pharmaceutical company for a few years and they're just cashing a couple of million pounds worth of shares from that company are they going to be completely objective about making management decisions well of course they will claim that they are but i'll let you decide how valid that claim is likely to be hierarchical power structures and loyalty people having to do what they're told uh, the public relation propaganda over scientific integrity so public relations, propaganda, let me think, does propaganda mean lying? It certainly means misrepresenting or, or putting a particular spin on data, doesn't it? Um, propaganda and all the nasty implications of that. Propaganda in relation to science, we should have objectivity, not propaganda in relation to science. Universities, according to the article, have adopted a neoliberal market approach, actively seeking pharmaceutical funding on commercial terms. Universities do seek money. There's no question about that. As a result, university departments become uh, instruments of industry. So the very academics that are supposed to be promoting the objectivity become part of what some might call a racket. As a result, university departments become instruments of industry through company control of the research agenda. So the corporates can actually uh, suggest, dictate what research is done. So they can say, well, there's a few million dollars there if you research that or if you want to research that I'm not giving you anything for that so there's that saying isn't there uh, who pays the piper calls the tune they can select what research they do and uh, we can all think of articles where there's been ghost writing claimed lately ghost writing and ghost writing and medical journal articles uh, and continuing medical ed ed education. So who is actually writing these articles? And some people that have looked at uh, styles can recognise ghost writing. Academics become agent for the promotion of commercial products. Um, the exact subjectivity that academia is supposed to continuously 
fight against. Uh, the corporate university also compromises the concept of academic leadership. So obviously, if you're a senior academic, uh, that's because you've worked really hard and done lots of research and done lots of clever papers, isn't it? So deans, proper academics, who've got their by hard graft, have in places been replaced with fundraisers and academic managers. I can tell you from my experience that this is true people are employed because they can gain funds for the institution they become academic managers i've had uh, senior managers over me working in academia who were not academically qualified just ridiculous well i mean they would probably had a degree or something but they certainly weren't researchers or they certainly didn't have PhDs um, a lot of them it's just just ridiculous um, academic managers who are forced to demonstrate their profitability or show how they can attract corporate sponsors certainly true I have come across people who've been uh, employed um, because they could attract funds and when they cease to attract funds, their employment seemed to cease as well. People employed by universities to attract in funding. Uh, in medicine, those who succeed in academia are likely to be key opinion leaders. Appalling acronym. COLS in marketing prevalence. I hate these things. COLS. <laughs> key opinion leaders whose career can be advanced through opportunities provided by industry. Uh, physicians uh, are, select, are selected based on their influence on prescribing habits for other physicians because they're uh, key opinion leaders. If they want to do well in the corporate sector, at least. Key opinion leaders are sought out by industry for this influence and for the prestige that their university affiliation brings. So there's this misuse, according to this article, um, misuse, according to this article, of, um, let's see now if I can focus that up again. No, this one's out of focus. That's OK. This one's fine. People who are using their academic uh, background to say, well, I'm an academic and I'm telling you this is right, you know, that, so, so whatever anyone tells you, we have to say, well, what's your evidence for that? It doesn't matter how senior they are. It doesn't matter if they're the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Prime Minister, um, the leading professors in the country, the Chief Medical Officer, it doesn't matter. You can't say this is right because I'm saying so. You've always got to give the evidence. And of course, we can only have the evidence if we can have the raw data because we haven't got the openness. So, we're kind of stuck in this uh, vicious circle, unfortunately. Coles uh, present results of industry trials at medical conferences in education, continuing medical management. So, in other words, uh, a lot of us are treated like mushrooms. We're just given the information that they want us to have. Instead of attracting, uh, instead of acting as independent, disinterested scientists, um, and critically evaluating a drug's performance, they become what marketing executives refer to as product champions. What an appalling phrase. Your job is to go out and champion this product, make sure people buy this product. While universities fail to correct uh, misrepresentations of the science from such collaborations, presumably because there's a lot of money in it, uh, Critics of industry face rejection from journals. They don't get published. In fact, these days we could even say uh, rejection from certain social media platforms. Legal threats and the potential destruction of their careers. Because, of course, in academia, it's to be an academic, you've got to publish. It's publish or perish idea, isn't it? The journals aren't accepting your papers. You're not going to get your uh, research assessment funding. 
This uneven playing field is exactly what concerned Karl Popper when he wrote about this suppression and control of the means of science communication. So this was anticipated way back in the 40s by Karl Popper. We must not suppress and control the means of scientific communication. It needs to be completely open. We need complete freedom of speech in the scientific domain and right now we have not got that in the scientific domain or in the medical domain. Regulators, and th this is appalling, regulators, the actual people that are doing the regulating receive funding from industry and use industry funded perform and use industry funded and perform trials to approve drugs. So again it's completely circular without in most cases seeing the raw data. Now this actually did shock me. I did think in my naivety that regulators had access to all of the core data, the basic core data that these decisions were based on, but it turns out that very often they don't. That was, I was actually surprised at that. Drug companies mark their own homework. Give yourself whatever mark you want. Uh, let me think. I think I'll actually rate this video. Um, is this video any good or not? Let me think. Tell you what, um, I'm going to give myself 10 out of 10 for this video. Actually, I'm certainly not. But, but, but you see the absurdity of marking your own homework. Drug companies mark their own homework. And of course, we've seen so many examples of uh, science by press release, haven't we? So the, the, these authors, um, these authors here who've written... Uh, worked extensively on this, have written books and stuff on this. Um, the, what are they suggesting? Uh, liberation of regulators from drug company funding. Regulators should be completely independent, not funded by drug companies. Taxation should be imposed on pharmaceutical companies to allow public funding of independent trials. Or we need independent trials basically carried out by totally disinterested people who are fascinated by the trial but have no financial interest in the outcome i mean it's so obvious it doesn't but why do they even have to say this it's just utterly patently obvious that this needs to be done Anonymized individual patient level trial data uh, posted. Now, it is quite possible to do this. It's quite possible to take the data from uh, trials and anonymize it, make it available, and then academics, statisticians, scientists around the world can, can analyze it. So, for example, you could post medical data and engineering departments will be able to analyse it because they're very good at statistical analysis. Why wouldn't we do that? Then see if the engineers agree with the doctors, see if they agree with the statisticians. And if the stats are right, they, they will. But we can't do that without the data. Garbage in, garbage out. Unless we've got the raw data, it's very hard to do anything at all. Um, along with study protocols, of course, on suitably accessible websites. I mean, what, very often what you say with this data is that uh, data will be released uh, on reasonable request. So, you know, if, you're, if you've got a team of academics from a reputable university with statistical capacity and they say, well, can we have a look at this data? Th then, yeah, that's a reasonable request, of course, that that will be done. Trial participants uh, could require trialists to make data freely available. Now, trial, trial participants, people that take part, agree to be patients in clinical trials. It is a noble, beautiful thing to do because what, what I will be doing is if I'm organising a clinical trial, I'd say, well, look, I've got a new drug here that I think might work. Um, can you come into this trial, please? And I might give you that drug. But there again, I might give you a placebo. If it's a one-to-one -one trial, there'd be a 50-50 chance of getting either. So many people are going into these trials, some of whom know they're dying, um, but are prepared to go into the trial knowing there's perhaps a 50% chance they'll get a placebo in order that the next generation may benefit from their 
outcomes. That is a noble, beautiful thing to do. And for that to be subverted into commercial interests is just, just appalling. Just appalling that that would happen. So trial participants could have something to say here. And this could easily be done by the reworking of uh, uh, consent forms for trials. That wouldn't be a difficult thing to do or not. The open and transparent publication of data are in keeping with our moral obligations to trial participants. We have a moral obligation to these people who have uh, given so much that knowledge may be uh, progressed. So there we go. Um, that's all based pretty directly, actually, on that paper from the British Medical Journal. It is peer reviewed. So we can assume that all the references and everything that are there are uh, correct. Uh, the bits I've checked are correct. Um, and it's not it's not it's not a pleasant uh, it's not a pleasant read by any means. And um, you can understand why there's a lack of trust. Now, again, I really want to emphasize this is not a, a critique of individual doctors and nurses that they're following the protocols. And in fact, you'll get into trouble. So if there was a particular protocol and um, so a particular treatment was required for a particular condition and an individual clinician thought, well, you know, I don't think that's right. I think I'll do something else. And then something went wrong. The first question is the lawyer would ask, well, well, did you follow protocols? Did you follow the national guidelines? And of course, if you don't, you haven't got a leg to stand on. So, so doctors and nurses basically have to follow national guidelines but they seem to be largely dictated by um, commercial interests and that needs to change so let's hope uh, politicians are looking at this the proposed reforms here there are many uh, dozens of others of course in in the books uh, that the authors have suggested and uh you know, it's just about the purity of science isn't it you know it, 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 this is the quest for truth and uh you know that's what this is about that what 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 is true what is correct that that, that is that is what science is and uh, at the moment that is being uh, contaminated very often by short term commercial interests okay thank you for watching